Good evening and welcome to episode 11 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandungwa Kumalo. We're now on day 28 of the national lockdown. And on this evening's episode, I'm joined by Grant Gavin, who's the owner of Remax Panache, a speaker and a business coach. And we'll be talking about, you know, some of the costs that goes that, that are involved in selling your home. So yesterday we we're speaking about you know, how to increase the value of your property in the event where you wanted to sell. And today we'll be discussing some of the costs and some of them aren't just financial. There are various costs involved um, that perhaps many people would not know of. I know I certainly learned quite a few when I was uh, speaking to Grant a bit earlier. Uh, Grant, thank you so much for joining us this evening. How's it going? Nice to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, a nice little distraction before our president addresses the nation again. <laughs> you keep I on. know, right? I think all of us are anticipating that address uh, this evening. Uh, and, and most likely, more likely than not, we'll probably get another extension. I mean, if we've been looking at some of the figures from the health minister, we're more likely to receive another extension in our lockdown. So it's going to be interesting to hear what the president's update is going to be. But before that, uh, I think let's do a little bit of property grants. I mean, I was saying that we're going to be talking about some of the costs. And of course, the biggest one is very likely the, the agent's commission. We touched on it slightly in uh, episode uh, 10 of the Private Property Podcast. But I want us to actually look a little bit into the agent commission that goes into that um, cost when selling a home. Yeah, I mean, very simplistically, we always say the buyer is responsible for his transfer costs and his transfer duty costs when he purchases. And the seller's main cost is commission, his agent's commission. But as we were talking about offline, you know, a seller has choices and has options and a seller can elect or choose to sell his or her house on their own, in which case they avoid commission or they can choose to use an agency and then there is a charge for commission. And somewhere in the middle now, we have these hybrid real estate agencies. So, you know, a seller right now today has so many different options to choose from. And basically, they're just going to make a decision. Do I want professional assistance or do I want to do it on my own? Um, and then, you know, the, the cost is relative because it's not just about price, it's always about the value that you get as well. And maybe let's speak a little bit about that value, right? Because I think different, as you we were saying, I mean, there are different agencies that work differently. There are now hybrid models. Some offer like relatively low percentage relative to others. Um, but of course, there's value that you would get from, for example, using an, an agent in selling your home. What's part of that value package that as a seller, you'd probably get that as a seller, you would not get if you don't opt to use an agent? Yeah, look, I think you know, we sit from the agency perspective and you know, people are predictable. Human beings are predictable. And we watch people who list their homes privately. And you know, I'm a big believer of choice and power of choice. And it's anybody's choice to sell their home in any which way they would like to. Um, but we know what's going to happen when people put their homes on the market. And we know the patterns of human behavior of what happens. And we can see the pain points that are going to come in that sequence of events you know, right from the beginning. But having said that, you know, if you're going to be employing an agent or an agency and you're going to be paying them a professional fee, I think it's advisable on every seller's shoulders is to sit down and question that agent. How are you going to bring me value during this transaction? Most importantly, how are you going to guide me on what's happening in the market right now? You know, are you a local market expert? And it's the top producing agents in any area who are selling multiple properties, who know the market better than anybody else. But also more than that, how are you going to bring me buyers? What is your marketing strategy? How do you market yourself? You know, what is your network of buyers? Who are you going to tap into? How are you going to bring buyers to my property? And how are you going to assist me get the highest possible price in the shortest amount of time? So there's a, there's a whole range of questions that a seller can, can ask an agent. And, and our, my advice to any seller is to question any prospective agent or agency on those points that I've mentioned there. You know, surprisingly, Grant, you know, as you were mentioning some of these questions, it's questions that I that would have not occurred to me. I think as people are probably sitting at home, we wouldn't even know what questions to ask uh, a potential um, agent because chances are some people go with the first person that they come across, as opposed to also actually shopping around and interviewing the very different agents to see if they are the right fit. So I mean, think about it from this. I mean, if you interviewed an agent and, and you said to the agent, where are your buyers going to come from? And they mm. said, I'm going to list your home on private property. And that was the only thing they said to you. <clears throat> Where's the differentiation there between agent A, B, C, D, or me as a seller listing it on private property myself? <laughs> you know, mm. so the question that you need to ask the agent in terms of what is your marketing strategy? How are you different to any other agent in the market? And how are you different to me doing this myself? 
And that's what every seller should be asking. And, 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 and I hope that that's actually insightful, you know, information for viewers at home. I, I've, so I've never had to sell a property. I mean, I've been buying uh, so far. And, and so the selling process is quite, quite new in many ways uh, for me. And I've only had conversations with different people. And often a lot of people in my circles are in the property circle. So they're more likely than not going to know an agent who would, more likely than not also just refer them to an area specialist. So they're guaranteed to be working with the right person for that particular area and probably understand that this is the person who understands my area, who bring the report around the sales in the area. So that even when you're setting a price, you're not overpricing your property, but you're also not undercutting yourself. Um, and I think as a prospective seller, it's so important that we understand it and see it from the other side, that this is a service where value is given and you can opt to do it for yourself, but this is what you're not going to get. Because the reality is, for the most part, we're not experts in this. So getting professional help does actually come in quite handy. And, and every, you know, not every seller is selling a home every year. So you know, typically most sellers are selling their home in anywhere between five to seven, 10 years. You know, who knows what it's going to be like in our new economy now after lockdown. Um, but that is the number one most important aspect of selling a home is where am I going to pitch this home to the market? What price am I going to put it on it? And is that price going to attract buyers in, in the given current market conditions? And with, with all due respect to any seller, it's, it's very, very difficult to sit there and pick up the Sunday paper or go onto private property and look at the prices of all the properties that are listed and think that you can compare your homes to those um, and then set a, a price that's going to attract buyers to start, you know, coming through your home and putting putting pen to paper. Um, it's it's the it's quite often the buyers on the other end of the spectrum who know value before Mr. and Mrs. Seller because the buyers, you know, when your home's listed on the market, those buyers have already been looking for two to three weeks. They've probably run through two to five to ten different homes. They're really getting a really good understanding of what represents value in the current market. So if your home gets listed onto the market above market value. Those buyers are very smart. They're very well educated now. And they'll stay away from something that's overpriced. So buyers, just as much as agents, understand what value represents in, in, in any given market. And I think, you know, if you look at you know, shows just like this one, and even uh, when you go on privateproperty.co.za, we have various resources that are now more than ever empowering, um, you know, buyers in helping them make the right decision on their home ownership journey. So the times of you know, setting a price and thinking people are just going to go for the price and not going to negotiate it down are essentially gone. So if you're a seller, those are some of the things that you essentially need to think about. Now, Kevin, one of the things before we get to the stuff that costs rands and cents, one of the things that you actually mentioned uh, when we were speaking offline was also the opportunity cost of the property being on the market for too long. Can you just take us through that particular cost? You know, what I was referring to there, it doesn't just have, have, sorry, doesn't have to just occur to somebody who is distressed or a seller is distressed. Mm. Any seller that chooses to um, list their home by themselves and try and sell their home by themselves to save money, if they don't get it right from the beginning and their home stays on the market for three to six months longer than they would have taken if they'd used the services of a professional person, there's the opportunity cost of that home being on the market. And the biggest opportunity cost there is that the the eventual selling price will be lower the longer that home stays on the market. Any property that stays on the market for a prolonged period of time, and we've got statistics in our office to prove this, that the eventual asking price as a percentage of the original listing price is lower the longer the home stays on the market. It becomes stale. And it becomes almost like a stigmatized property where people stay away from it. Oh, there must be something wrong with that property. Exactly. So then there's a cost of not just the reduced uh, eventual purchase price that you achieve, but there's also the cost of holding that property for a much longer period of time. And I make reference to people who could be in distress. You know, they might make a decision to, to go for the cheapest alternative of selling their home, which is to do it themselves. But if you get it wrong, you're going to be going to an agency six months down the line who will then start the process at the correct price and with the correct marketing strategies. And this prolonged period of time actually ends up costing people. And it's painful for us to see because we know, particularly people in distress, they're trying to hang on for a higher price because of what they need to get themselves out of trouble. But what ends up happening is they price the property too high, it stays on for too long, and end up carrying the cost of their property for a lot longer as well. 
And if anything, I mean, I, I know with some of the properties that I've bought is that the moment I can see that a property has been on the market for too long, I already use that when I negotiate because I can say, but this actually hasn't moved for uh, a number of months. And one of the questions I'll probably ask myself is, A, is there something wrong with it? B, is it overpriced? And if it's overpriced and it's still not moving, then I know that I can go in on a lower offer. And if you see, I mean, I've seen certain properties being on the market for over a year. And, and by that time, the, the seller is willing to pretty much take any offer because it stayed on the market for longer than what they anticipated. And yeah. it's easy to even get sometimes even up to 40, 50% less than what they were asking for. Um, and I think we're now getting to a point where a lot of sellers, a lot of buyers, we're already thinking on that level. We literally look at when to do list this. And if you're interested in an area, I mean, I have alerts on the different areas that I'm interested in. Yeah. So I'm able to see that actually your property uh, was on, you first tried to sell it by yourself and now you've given it to this agent. And now you've changed agents because chances are as a seller, you probably didn't want to go, um, you didn't want to listen to the agent in terms of the pricing. And now you go to another one and it's still priced incorrectly. So by the time you go to the third person who advises you to like go, let's say it's 40,000 and less, I know I can still low ball, like I can still put in a low offer because it's been sitting on such a badly priced, um, you know, price point that it's yeah. easy for me to say, but you've been hanging on to this for over 12 months. If you're really serious, here's the offer. So I always, I used to do um, seller educational workshops and I do buyers educational workshops. And one of the stories I used to tell the seller, cause it's very hard for a real estate person to speak to a, a seller about pricing, because they always think we're trying to keep their price down. But what we're trying to do is price it realistically to attract demand from buyers. So I use a story of walking into a bakery. I don't know if you've ever walked into a bakery early in the morning. When I lived in London, there was an amazing bakery called Greg's Bakery. We walked past it, you could smell the fresh croissants in the morning. So those fresh croissants come out, they're maybe a one pound of croissant, and they smell really, really fresh. And you just want to go in and buy that croissant because it's just smelling yeah. so good. Come back at lunchtime, and that smell's now gone. And now he's made his fresh sandwiches for lunchtime, and it's the sandwiches that are smelling good. So you can't continue to sell the fresh croissant for one pound now. He's got to bring the price down to 50p and hope somebody buys it when they're competing now with the sandwiches. Mm. Walk past that baker in the evening when maybe they've got other sorts of things out there or the croissants are now so stale, you're not going to sell them for 50p. And eventually at the end of the day, he's giving them away or he's throwing them out. And it's the same thing as your, you know, your house just goes stale if it stays on the market for longer. And the consumer is very aware of it. And that is very true. If you've just joined in, you're of course tuned into the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantung Kumal, and today we're talking about some of the costs involved in selling your home. And joining me for our conversation is Grant Gavin, who is the owner of Freemax Panache. He's a speaker and also a business coach. Uh, we're of course taking some of your comments or questions if you're watching us from home. And if you'd like us to address some of them, do send them through and Grant and I will go through them. We've got a uh, comment here coming in from Clevan Gomo who asks, um, we are dealing with an educated market currently in terms of buyers the fair wear and tear and condition of the property plays a very good role in getting the required value of the property which is exactly what we're saying grant um, and another one here from desiree ranoko and um, this one is a question and she asks can a seller still negotiate the commission fee even after signing the market agreement contract so when you say the market agreement, I'm talking, I'm, you're talking about the sole mandate agreement or the yes, right so to list? Yes, I actually market. assume it's the, the mandate agreement between the, the owner and so, the, the agent. Strictly speaking, it's a legal document. And if it's agreed between a seller and an agent at the beginning of the agreement or the contract that we will sell your house for 4% or 5%, it is a contracted agreement. Okay. So strictly speaking, it's cast in stone. Is anything in life negotiable? Absolutely. Um, and now, you know, Grant, I'd actually like us then to go through some of the more rands and cents um, issues in terms of items that a, a seller or prospective seller needs to be mindful of beyond um, the, the um, what is this, the agent's commission that we were speaking about earlier. Uh, and of course, one of them is the, the rates and taxes clearance certificates. I mean, some people probably might not be aware of it. Can you just take us through that a little bit? Yeah. I think it's really pertinent. So obviously you've got to be up to date with your rates and taxes for a property to be registered or transferred. Um, so if there's unpaid rates and taxes, and again, I refer specifically to people who've fallen behind, those have to be caught up to date. They have to be paid up to date before um, you get a rates clearance certificate. 
when it comes to buying in sectional title schemes and or selling your property in sectional title schemes, they're going to ask you for about three months of uh, sectional title levies in the complex, and they're going to take that up front just so that there's a, there's a whole timing factor. And then they, they sort of tally it up at the end and they'll reimburse if it's been overpaid or underpaid. So I think more pertinently right now is if people are falling behind on their rates and taxes, they have to understand that if they want to sell their property, they have to catch up with those costs because the municipality will not issue a rates clearance certificate. And I think the, the big thing to note with that one, um, I can't remember which, which year uh, where the legislation changed, where, I mean, I know previously you would buy a property and the, the, the municipality amount would then fall on the new buyer. Uh, but now, of course, legislation has changed where that sticks with the seller. And uh, as a buyer, you essentially get it at zero and a new account is started with you. Because that used to be quite a big pressure point uh, where people would buy properties and they, they weren't aware that all this money had essentially accumulated. And you buy a property only to discover that, you know, they're in arrears 50, 80, 100,000 rands. So now that's actually not possible. So as a seller, you essentially need to make sure, um, as Grant is saying, that not only are you paid up, um, or that no, not only do you keep up with the payment, but that you also um, paid up. And of course, then the other um, cost grant, and without even having to get a sense of how much it is in actual rands and cents, but the other costs are some of the compliance certificates that go into um, when, when you have to sell your place. Yeah, so by law, you've got to get something like an electrical compliance certificate. Some provinces, you have to get plumbing certificates. Uh, you have to get an entomologist report. And those costs are all for the, for the seller's account. Um, of course, it's not just the cost of the certificate, which is in some instances mostly you know, quite a reasonable cost. But mm. um, I'll never forget once I used to uh, buy and sell and flip properties and I, I bought a property um, on the Berea in the morning. So it was a very, very old property and I bought it from a, a deceased estate from a lady who had literally lived there for 60 or 70 years. And she had never changed the electrical wiring from the old um, English UK standard. <laughs> so <laughs> I now got the shock of my life. You know, it wasn't just about the inspection. It was the fact that the electrician went in and said, we have to rewire this entire flat. It was about 14, 15,000 rand that I had not accounted for. So wherever there's repairs that need to be done, you have to repair the electrics to put it into fit working order for the next buyer, uh, for, that, uh, for that electrician to sign off that certificate. So it's not just a certificate, it's the electrical repairs that might come with that as well. Yeah. I would imagine it's the same for the plumbing certificate. We don't have that in KZN, but I know some provinces do have plumbing certificates that are required. I think I, I actually, I haven't had to have, um, I haven't encountered needing a plumbing certificate, um, but I know that it's certainly in certain areas, it's certainly something that you must account for. I think even yeah. a gas certificate um, might yes, be one of the fine. items yeah that you essentially need to have but the one of your your um commenters earlier actually made a very valid point about the wear and tear mm -hmm. so as a seller one of the costs and of maintenance is keeping your property in good condition you know if you haven't painted your house for years or if you've allowed your electrics to deteriorate or you haven't kept the garden in, in good nick that's all going to impact on your price and ultimately the net proceeds that you're going to get from the sale if you're now putting money into electrical repairs but if you allow your, your property to deteriorate in terms of physical maintenance, that's going to massively impact the price that you are, are going to get from a potential purchaser. And I think then that also just speaks to, um, as, a, as, a, as, as an owner of a property, whether it's your primary residence or you've got um, you know, rental properties, just the importance of keeping sure that the property is uh, well kept of a property that you're staying in but some some owners of uh, especially rental properties tend to then not take care of their rental property sometimes don't actually go and physically see how they look like they just let the agent be the one who does that for them but understanding the state of your rental property yes it might be making you money right now perhaps some years down the line you might want to sell it it's so important to then understand how that place looks like um, at a very like regular level because suppose then a couple of years later you actually want to offload that particular asset and you find that it's actually been worn out quite significantly and you might possibly not even get the price that you want for it and a lot of a lot of people a lot of homeowners underestimate uh, that that is quite a significant cost and i say significant in terms of the value that you're going to get when you sell it one day 
Mm. You know, we always think of what are my costs when I'm buying a property? I've got to be able to afford my bond, pay my rates, pay my taxes, pay my levies, um, whatever costs are associated with that. But we forget that, you know, every sort of three to five years, you're probably gonna have to paint that house. You have to paint the roof, you have to clean the gutters, you have to maintain the garden. And if you don't, it's only gonna deteriorate over time. And it gets to a point where by the time it comes to catch up on all that, it becomes quite a costly expense to do massive repair work, you know? So it's, it's quite a good idea to factor in those costs when you buy a property as well. I know we're talking about sellers now, but buying a home it also entails maintaining that property and keeping it in good condition. And it's definitely an episode that we'll touch on. I think the, the costs associated with home ownership is something that people tend to underestimate quite significantly. Like you're saying, I think even when uh, somebody's doing their budget uh, for when or how their finances are going to look like after they've bought a place, they often only account, for example, for the bond payment. Um, some people don't even know that they have to account, for example, for the levies, uh, perhaps insurance uh, might be in the mix and the other associated costs. So I think that's certainly an episode that we we need to have because you need to be going into home ownership understanding the different layers of home ownership and the different items that you essentially be paying for as you you know own your new property uh, we've got another question here uh, grants that's coming in this time from lena davis who asks if you are restructuring would you also need to settle um rates and taxes by restructuring getting a new bond on the property I would assume it's restructuring is probably your, your assets. Um, yeah, so probably a new bond or maybe when you're extending your finance. Um, I think, Lena, if you're able to just outline for us what exactly you mean by restructuring, because there are different things that you can restructure. So you can restructure your actual... I would, I would imagine payment. she's referring to refinancing her home. Um, yeah. That's the only thing I can imagine. You know, I think if, you, if you're on... It's when you come to sell, you need the rates clearance certificate. I'm not familiar, you'd have to probably ask a bond finance person if they're refinancing a property, do they need to see that rates and taxes are up to date? Um, I'm not entirely certain, so I'm not going to give an answer, I don't know. Okay, so I think, Lena, in the event where you do mean refinancing or restructuring the portfolio, um, we'll be sure to get in our restructuring guide. I did say the last time we had a conversation, uh, I think we had Yaku, um, and there was quite a lot of questions around restructuring and how do we structure our property um, in order for us to be getting maximum value for it. And we did promise that we'll be covering, um, you know, or we'll have an episode around restructuring and structuring our property portfolios in the most efficient way. So we'll definitely add that question uh, when we have our next expert who will help us with that particular topic. We've got another uh, question here grant from Clevan Ngomo who asks how long are the certificates valid for and what recourse does one have in the event of any faults during the validity of the certificates who takes care of those costs so you're talking about the electrical compliance certificates now yeah. well, that's that can cause such an issue in a real estate transaction um, particularly where sellers are choosing their friends and people that they know to come in and do electrical okay. compliance certificates and we've you know we've had We've had so many instances, unfortunately, where a buyer has moved in, there's a certificate, but they'll go into the roof and there'll be a problem. Um, you know, then the onus is on that person who provided that certificate to prove the work that they did was, was valid. Um, and it now becomes a legal issue between the new seller and you know, going after the person whose certificate was placed into the file, the attorney's mm -hmm. file. Um, it's a very difficult one. Look, it doesn't happen a lot. A lot. I mean, we've had a fair amount of instances of that over many, many years, but you know, it does become a challenge. And particularly, you know, we always say to sellers, it's, it's hard to recommend and refer because you don't want to recommend and refer and somebody lets down. But there is a panel of electrical compliance certificates um, or electricians, entomologists that an estate agency will use time and time again. And I'd always say to, to homeowners, I would go with the recommendation of an estate agent because it is somebody that they deal with and they're reputable. And there's always more comeback with somebody who you have a long-standing relationship with. It's very, very difficult if you get your friend to, <laughs> to suddenly just come in and because he's qualified and he puts together a certificate, that leads to all sorts of challenges for, for all parties concerned. So you know, the recommendation there is to use a reputable and a electrical compliance company or an entomologist company that the estate agency deals with time and time again. And you know, Grant, surprisingly, one of the things that I've also found, especially when buying up um, 
rental properties is that sometimes you're able to get creative in some of the clauses that you put in the offer to purchase. So for example, I mean, I've seen certain buyers say that they'd like to choose the electrical, the company that does the electrical work in order to ensure that uh, it's done uh, properly because we 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 know of instances where sometimes a seller will you know pay their friend to do a certificate knowing very well that their their electrical work isn't actually up to date um, and sometimes we've seen sellers saying that they'd like to use their preferred uh, transferring attorneys so there are different ways particularly your property investors have been able to navigate the the offer to purchase um, but like you're saying I think more often than not very reputable estate agents would typically recommend. Um, a few companies that they they're used to working with and and one would trust that especially if that company is also reputable themselves that the work that being that's being done is actually um up to standard um it really, I think it really comes down to relationships so you know if you have a work a good working solid relationship with a reputable company you know when something goes wrong you there's a vested interest from both parties to make it right you know, if it's a once-off operation with a once-off transaction with a once-off supplier, it's so much more difficult, you know, trying to get to the bottom of it and resolve something because if the, if the fly by night type personality will just fly by night. Um, so I agree with your comments there. It's always better to use somebody where there's a good relationship with, with the estate agency and that particular company. So Lena did come back to us. She was, um, she, she was actually talking about refinancing. So Lena will definitely bring in an expert who will be helping us navigate uh, when we restructure our portfolios, when we refinance our portfolios, what the, what the effects of that are, who are the different sort of stakeholders you need to be notifying because I know you need to be having a conversation with your bank. How do you best structure that? Uh, so we'll definitely be covering that in our future episodes. Now, of course, another uh, cost grant is the bond cancellation fee in the event where the property that you're selling is bonded. So not a lot of people realize this, is that when you cancel your bond, sometimes you have a 90-day cancellation clause. So it's better to put the notice in with your bank as soon as possible. So when you, you know, it's something that should be brought up by the estate agents as well is, you know, do you have a cancellation clause on your bond? Let's put in the notice now. Let's let the bank know now. So at least we don't get a surprise when we sell the property and we've now got to pay a three extra monthly payments on our bond um, mm. or whatever the notice period may be. So that is something that a lot of homeowners don't, don't understand is that there may, may not be a cancellation clause on your bond. Okay. And then the last one, Grant, is the capital gains tax. And, I, I, and we won't get too much into this one because it can be quite technical. Um, and I think that also needs its own experts, you know, to kind of break it down for us. But if you can just briefly go through capital gains tax as something that as a seller, you need to be mindful of uh, in the event where you're selling your property. Look, capital gains tax is just a minefield of loopholes and and various tactics and we actually had somebody come into our office and i was speaking to you off, off air about this the yeah. best thing you can do with regards to any strategy towards capital gains tax is to find an accountant or somebody who knows how to how to <laughs> understands the, the the entirety of that law you know, if yeah. it's your single primary residence it's not as serious but you know there are ways that you can bring your capital tax down and your capital gains tax down you need to, and again, this is what we were talking about right from the beginning. Pay a professional person to do a good job for you and you will save way more money in the long run. Pay a professional to sit with you and work out how you can reduce your capital gains tax because there are so many ways that you can reduce capital gains tax that even I didn't realize until I sat in this training session. But not many real estate agents are going to sit with you and explain to you how to reduce capital gains tax. So my advice on that is to go and find the best financial person that you can, and he will, he or she will take you through um, the best way of handling capital gains tax. And Grant, before I let you go, any tips that you'd have for any uh, sellers who are looking into selling their properties in the coming weeks or coming months? Yeah, we're going into very, very interesting times. And we were chatting earlier just about, we do not know, first and foremost, how the market's gonna react when we all get released on parole and we come back out of our houses and we all flood back into the market. We value properties, professional property uh, practitioners, we value properties based on current sales. And there have been zero sales pretty much over the, over the month of April. So we will only know how the market has been impacted as we start running buys through homes again and we start taking offers. And you know, 
we don't even know whether there's going to be a flood of homes coming onto the market after lockdown. The indications are that you know, we already were in a buyer's market before we went into lockdown. If more people are going to be in distress, if the economy is hurting, the, the indications there was that more stock will come onto the market when we come into after the lockdown period. And that has implications on the market. But how this market reacts is for me, it's really exciting now because it's, it's going to be unknown territory. You've got interest rates at almost historic lows. You've had two massive decreases in the last month. Mm -hmm. So there is the potential for buyers to come out there and say it's an amazing time to buy. But then the reality is, is that you know, so many people could have lost their jobs over the last, you know, or had salary reductions over the last month. So how are the buyers going to react? And we will only know when we step foot back into the marketplace. And that's why I think now more than ever, it's going to be so important to have a professional on your side who knows the market, can read the market, and will react to it as quickly as possible. Because then we can adjust things like pricing strategies. We can get the home sold in the shortest possible time. But it's, it's, yeah, I'm saying exciting, and I don't mean to sound disrespectful. It's just exciting because, I don't know about you, I've never lived through a global pandemic before. So this is the first time for all of us. But yeah. you want to just know that you've got an expert who knows the local market and who will pick up the signs, pick up the, the changes very, very quickly and will be there to guide you and advise you along the way. We've got two last uh, questions for, from our listeners at Home Grant that I actually want us to, to address. The one is from Yolandi Paper who asks, are all the bank, banks notice create 90 days or, does, or do banks differ? I think you need to check with your bank. Yeah, because from what, from what I know, not all of them are necessarily the same, but you do need to check um, with your respective bank. The banks that I bank with, I know a lot of them, you, you have to put in that 90-day notice. Um, yeah. but it is I think the advice here is, is just be aware of it and yeah. to go and look into it and get the advice from your bank and find out and exactly this, what yours is. Yeah, and this last one, uh, Grant, I don't know if you, you'd be able to, to assist, but it's definitely something from the, sell, from the buyer side. Um, and we'll def if we can't you know, properly answer it this evening, we'll definitely uh, slot it in when we speak about, you know, the costs associated when you're a buyer. And this one says, um, this is coming from the buyer side. What do I get the buyer's, or what, what do I get the buyer's costs when I had included all my costs as a buyer in my bank loan or mortgage amount? I never got the lawyer's cost breakdown and I have tried to contact the lawyer with no avail. What resources might I have? So what I'm understanding there is he's, he's had a whole lot of costs lumped up into his bond and yeah. he hasn't seen the breakdown from it. So who was, now I'd go and find out who the conveyancing attorney was as my first point of call. And I'd ask for a breakdown of costs. Although it sounds like he said he's done that, yeah. uh, which means he's not getting professional legal advice that he's asked for. I'm not a lawyer. There is a law society. Um, I would just keep asking the question. I'd go back to those people because in every property transaction that I've ever transacted in, I've had a complete breakdown in the form of an invoice from an attorney, which has shown me step by step everything that I've paid for and everything that's gone towards the purchase of that property. And, and I think to add that, and it's actually quite, um, when you're correct, Grant, with, when I look at all the properties I've bought, you, if you, and especially if they are bonded, the bond registration attorney as well as the transferring attorney send you an invoice with literally line items down to yeah. like stamps it's 20 rands and every single item um so if the amount let's say comes to 20 or thirty thousand rand they can account for each cent um down to the last total so in the yeah. event where you're not winning with the with the lawyer i mean you've probably if it's a bonded property you've got the bond registration attorneys as well as the transferring attorneys so it would be interesting to know which one of the two is um, you're not getting joy from, um, but also then speak to the bank because if they said they've lumped it up in the, with the bank, ask the bank for that breakdown. Cause I know when, when the account has just been opened, uh, you'll see what the different costs are. So you'll be able to at the very least get that breakdown um, yeah. from the bank itself. You know, this but, is why um, something like buyer education is so important. So important. And yeah. I said to you earlier, I did the seller's education and I used to do the buyer's education. And for me, the buyer's education um, sessions that I did were so much more valuable because we have such a large majority of our population who have never bought a home before. And even at the, pri the private property, property show, I've spoken to at two of them where I do my first time buyer presentation. And the questions that I get afterwards, it's amazing. People come up to me and they're asking me, I don't say that they're basic questions, but they're asking me basic legal questions and generally coming from a place where they've been hard done by, where somebody has been unscrupulous 
or has misguided them in the process. So I, I do believe if you do any shows, one of the most powerful shows you can do is on educating buyers on all these types of questions so that they are prepared before they go into the transaction. And Grant, it's definitely topics that we'll be exploring right here on the Private Property uh, Podcast. And it's, it's partly the reason why we do this show, because we understand that we now more than ever, we need our buyers to, to be empowered, to know, uh, you know what is out there. And that your property journey doesn't have to be one that is difficult, uh, where you lose out on money or where, you don't, where you're not able to be empowered enough to write, ask the right questions when you're buying your um, respective properties. So Grant, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I see that the presidency has uh, finally announced that the president is going to be speaking to us at Office 8. So we're all going to be waiting uh, to hear what uh, President Ramakosa will be saying. Uh, thank you very much at home for tuning in to the, property, uh, to the Private Property Podcast. I've been your host, Zamantunga Kumar. I hope you're staying at home and you're staying safe until tomorrow evening. Remember, tomorrow evening we will be having a representative from APSA for our first ever Ask Private Property. So if you have any questions that you'd like answered uh, from a bank's perspective. So if you ever wanted to ask the bank a question around Around your home journey and your home uh, loan application journey, do send in those questions and we'll be sure to answer them tomorrow evening. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you very much, Grant. Pleasure. Bye-bye.